Um, thanks for coming, everyone. Let's do, uh, let's, let's pray, shall we? Can you all hear me okay online? Sure can. Great. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for uh, this moment to gather together around your word. And Lord, I pray that it would be so good for us that you would encourage our hearts tonight, that you would show us something from your word that's life-giving and rich, that you'd help us understand this text, that you'd help us fall in love with the Bible. God, thank you for this book. Thank you for giving us words of life, and I do pray that it would be life-giving to us tonight. I pray that you'd inspire what is said through your Holy Spirit. Amen. You fade right. away there toward the end, Tom. Oh, I did? Yeah. We got it. Good. You got it. You got the gist of it. Yeah. yeah. I was praying for you that you'd make it to 84. Did you hear that part? <laughs> <laughs> you old geezer. Uh -huh. uh, just kidding. All right. Um, here's what we're doing. We're on the second week of a four week study of the book of Hosea. So please come back. Is it did I say four weeks? Yeah. Is it only three weeks? Did I say three weeks? This is the second week. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not losing my mind yet. Yeah. So that's all right. I'm going to catch you up, Grogan's. I'm going to catch you up. All right. So, so um, if you remember, we're studying the book of Hosea, 12 books in your Old Testament that are called Minor Prophets. This is for you, Logan. Thank you. All right. You have four books in your Old Testament that are called major prophets. The difference between major prophets and minor prophets is simply the length of text. Okay, so it comes from the Latin majores, minores, longer books, shorter books. Okay, so we're in the book of Hosea. And if you remember, all 12 of these prophets were written by real people to the nation of either Israel or Judah during about a 500 year period of civil war in the nation remember the history that we described about that last week um in 933 around about 933 the the nation of israel proper right here on the map everything from the sea of galilee to the dead sea uh, was actually split in half right above the capital city of jerusalem um rehoboam solomon's son not such a cool guy Went to the Israelites and said, you thought my dad was tough? All the taxing that he did for you to build the temple, I'm going to be tougher. Solomon, son, Rehoboam, raises the tax rate in Israel astronomically high, creates massive inflation, and the people revolt. All right. Jeroboam leads a coup. Uh, he was not one of Solomon's sons. He's a government official. He leads a coup uh, against Rehoboam and the nation divides in 933 BC. Okay, you can read about all of this in the books of, anyone remember? First and second, come on, Sarah. Kings. Kings. So I don't know how much you guys know about the Old Testament. So did you know, have you read the book of Kings? Oh yeah, that's unusual. Yeah, the whole thing. Oh. It doesn't help. You got a good woman there, Grace. <laughs> all right, Logan. So, um, so the books of First and Second Kings provide what I like to think of as a historical backdrop for all the books of the prophets. You can read, come in. You can read the history of um, the United Kingdom with Solomon, David, Saul, and Solomon, the first three kings, and then Solomon or Sa Samuel, the first judge. Sorry, Samuel, David, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon. I mess that all up. All right, first Not judge. Yet. Yeah, last judge, first three kings. You, you can read about those kings, and then you can read about the divided kingdom, starting with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, all the way through the time of the exiles, when these two nations were both taken away to Assyria and Babylon. Okay, so if you want to think about what are the prophets and what are they doing, 
They are 16 real people who wrote to the real kings of either Israel, the northern kingdom, or Judah, the southern kingdom, during this period of civil war. And that's important to know, too, that the, the uh, 10 tribes in the north would retain the name Israel. The two tribes in the south who decided to stick with Rehoboam would retain the name Judah. Uh, and so Israel is going to refer to the northern 10 tribes. Judah is going to refer to the southern two tribes. And those two tribes are going to be in civil war with each other right around uh, the northern border there, just north of the capital city of Jerusalem. And over most of Israel and Judah's history in the kings, things were awful economically except for the time of the writing of Hosea. And this is what we talked about last week. The thing that's unique about the book of Hosea is that it's written into a time of incredible economic prosperity, which most people refer to as, you remember? The gold, golden, you remember? Golden age of Jeroboam. Yeah, golden age of Jeroboam. So uh, the king of Israel at the time is Jeroboam the second, not the guy that led the revolt I just described. We're hundreds of years past that now. Jeroboam the second, king in Israel, who was an evil king who didn't give a rip about God whatsoever. Yet God was prospering the nation. And it was producing all kinds of spiritual apathy. So, um, somebody needs to Can you meet Mel? Melanie? Melanie? And it is not depicting anyone acting in self-defense against someone attacking them, right? Might be Sandy. Maybe. Okay. Somebody's got background noise. There we go. All right. So, what I wanted to do just by way of review is read for you an introduction to this time, the time of Jer uh, Jeroboam II, the Golden Age, from one of my favorite Bible resources, How to Read the Bible Book by Book. If you do not have a hand Bible handbook, you need to get one, okay? And a Bible handbook, it gives you critical historical background information for every book of the Bible. So, it will tell you when you're reading Hosea, you need to realize the Golden Age, Jeroboam, blah, 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 okay? And I'm just going to read for you. Um, the historical background of the book of Hosea and Amos, by the way, can be found in 2 Kings chapter 14. Remember that? Uh, Jeroboam II, king in Israel, came to reign about this time and had a long and prosperous range, reign, which included territorial expansion of a kind that nearly equaled that of David and Solomon. So what's happening is this nation is expanding. Incredible. Okay. Um, expanding the borders and growing rich. And remember I told you why, because the nations to the north, Assyria and Syria, and the nation to the south, Egypt, are all three politically weak during this time frame. So all the goods and services and trade that's coming through these regions is being taxed by Israel and Judah, and they are just getting filthy stinking rich off of it, all right? So that's what we're going to read in this book here. This was made possible mostly because their reigns coincided with a very low period in the Assyrian fortune, right? Four weak Assyrian kings, remember? Until the time of the fifth king, Tiglath Pileser III. All right, remember him? So, yeah, so in 744 BC, Tiglath Pileser III ends a 40 year period of Assyrian weakness. And this area of wealth and prosperity, this era of wealth and prosperity, is completely over for Israel and Judah. But for just about a generation, man, these guys, the Israelites that we're going to read about, live high on the hog right here, because every time someone comes to this region, they're taxing them and tolling them on the roads. They're getting filthy, stinking rich, and the richer they get, the farther their hearts drift from God. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> hey, what's up, Kim? Come on in. So what we have in the book of Hosea is a time of unbelievable spiritual apathy during a time of unbelievable physical prosperity. Man, I just think this book is so relevant uh, for wealthy Americans. You know? And what's interesting about this book, as Hosea writes to these people, is they have no idea that uh, they're just within 20 short years of Tiglath-Pileser invading all of Israel and Judah and almost entirely wiping them out. 
They have no idea that they're just 20 years from the Assyrian, the nation of Assyria coming in and destroying all the northern kingdom. So they take over uh, everything in the north. Starting in 722, the Assyrians are going to come down. They're going to completely exile the, the 10 tribes in the north. By 722, the entire nation of Israel is gone, completely exiled to Assyria. And then by 701, they have destroyed every city in the south except for Jerusalem. But that's not known to the original audience of the book of Hosea. All they know is we got tons of money. God must not care that we don't care, right? He must be fine with our living. And so Hosea writes into that and in a really sharp and stark way says, oh, actually, not so much, right? Okay, questions, comments about that? And then we're going to dive in. All right. Let's, um, can you handle, I don't want to get too nerdy, but one, one of the things I wanted to do with this class is not just help you understand Hosea, but help you understand all the prophets as well. Uh, can you handle one more nerd fact? Okay, this is super important. Um, there are three, three major themes in the books of the prophets that you're going to see in this book and all other 15 of them. Sin, judgment, and restoration. And I want you, if you have a colored pencil, we're going to be looking at these themes tonight, themes of sin, judgment, and restoration. And what the prophets are going to do is they're going to come to the nation of Israel in terms of Hosea, and they're going to say, hey, here's the way you're breaking the covenant with God that you made at Mount Sinai. Remember the Ten Commandments, right? Everybody, right? Remember the law that God gave Israel at Mount Sinai? Um, the prophets are going to come to them, and they're going to say, here's the, here are the ways that you're breaking um, the law that God gave you at Mount Sinai. And don't forget, that's sin, okay? Don't forget that if you do that, God's a good dad. He's going to discipline you. He's going to bring judgment on your nation. He is going to discipline you. And the way he's going to do it, this is what we're going to see over and over in the prophets, is he's going to bring these nations of Assyria and Babylon. And they're actually going to remove you from the promised land. Now, you need to know why God would do that. Why, why would God say to the Israelites, if you continue to break the covenant that you made with me at Mount Sinai, I'm going to remove you from the promised land. Why would he do that? You, you, need, a, you need to have a theological answer for this. Um, living in the promised land was based on a covenant that they broke. Yeah, right. But and so I guess what I'm really driving at is why why would God make that covenant with them in that promised land in the first place? What is He trying to do by putting Israel in that place and giving them these laws? He's setting them apart for Himself. Yeah. If you go back to so one of the most important places in your Old Testament that you need to know about is Exodus 19 and 20, the giving of the Ten Commandments, and then the law that follows. And in Exodus chapter 19, Yahweh, God says to the Israelites, you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. The whole nation of you are priests. And what do priests do? They represent the person of God to the people of the world, right? And so the reason why God puts the Israelites right here is that he's literally putting them right in the mix of the cradle of civilization. Major world powers, major world powers, major area of trade around these world powers, the the Mediterranean Sea, which means in the middle of the nations, Mediterranean, middle of the nations. This is the middle of the known world, right? And he puts the Israelites here and he says, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. And as all these nations see you, they're going to know me. And so the reason why the prophets are coming to the Israelites and saying, hey, theme number one, you totally have broken the covenant that God gave you at Mount Sinai. Theme number two, God's going to remove you from the promised land. It's, that's judgment. That's the second theme. The reason why the prophets are saying that is because God is not going to allow the Israelites to be his priestly representative to the nations if they're not going to represent him properly, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why he's going to remove them from the promised land. So the prophets, we're going to see this over and over tonight in Hosea. The Hosea is going to say the Assyrians are coming and they are going to wipe you guys right out of here. But there's always a third theme that follows. And it's the theme of restoration. We're going to see it over and over in the book tonight. 
that God's going to say, but you know what? I'm never going to stop loving you. I'm never going to stop pursuing you with my love, even though you're like a whore to me and you run out and prostitute yourself to the nations. I'm going to buy you back, buy you back, buy you back. And that's the that third theme, theme you're going to see in the prophets, the theme of restoration. And I love that because it tells us who God is. Um, that even, even when God disciplines us justly, he never stops pursuing us with faithful love. Because his faithfulness to us is predicated upon his goodness, not ours. Right? So those three themes are just going to be everywhere in this book. And they really inform um, the heart and character of God. So I want you to color code. All right. Any thoughts, comments, questions about that? And then we're going to jump into chapter three. I'm going to read it. We're going to get through chapter six tonight. It's going to be super fun. Does that, do those three themes make sense? Like if you know that, if you know sin, judgment, and restoration, the prophets will make sense to you. Because they're always going to be talking one of those three things. Okay. Hey, will someone online um, read, read chapter three for me? And everybody get out their color for restoration. If you're tracing, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you're tracing the theme of restoration, get it out. Because chapter three is all about restoration. And we're going to see it. <clears throat> I'll read it. All right. <clears throat> the Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again though she is loved by another and it is and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I brought her her 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a shekel, a let, let I don't know how to pronounce that, lefta? of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will live with you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod and idol. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. All right, thanks, Sandy. Uh, chapter three, verse one. Remember I, I said that last week, one of the ways that prophets speak is pro prophetic show and tell, which I called enacted symbols, right? Mm -hmm. The prophet will actually go and do something physical to represent something spiritual. And here's God saying, all right, Hosea, I want you to go love this woman, go, Gomer, marry her, and go get her. She's just as I love the nation of Israel, right? 3-1, um, go love a woman who has a lover and who is an adulteress. And I think, um, remember what I said last week, that we shouldn't see this two-dimensionally and think, okay, God is telling Hosea to go and love someone that he otherwise had, would have want to have nothing to do with, who he's not attracted to, who he has no heart connection to whatsoever, and he's just going to have to will himself into it. No way. God, when has God ever done that with any of us, right? Like, th this person, Gomer, whoever she was, I guarantee you with somebody that Hosea was like genuinely head over heels with, like this dude fell in love with this woman at some point. I guarantee you he did. And then realized, oh, dang, she's a prostitute, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and married her anyway. And, and, um, and then God says to him, look, you love her the way I love the nation of Israel. She's going to keep running out on you and you just pursue her with faithful love. And that, that imagery in verse two, you know, just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turned to other gods and loved the raisin cakes, raisin cakes were a way that the Israelites worshiped false gods. They would go to every high hill. They would go under every green tree. That's one of the ways the prophets will speak about it. 
and they would eat and celebrate to idols of wood and stone. So that's what the raisin cakes represent. And I just love the fact that God says, this is how I feel about you. And this is what I want you guys to think about the heart of God. And we'll discuss it if you'd like. That God doesn't love you begrudgingly. He's not like, you know what? I don't really love Kim, but I'm going to, I'm going to will myself to love Kim. Like, don't think about Homer and Hosea that way, or Gomer and Hosea that way. Like, that's, like, this dude was genuinely head over heels with her, and she wanted nothing to do with him from the beginning, you know? And that's the way God pursues you. Why? Because his faithfulness is built on his goodness, not yours, right? Um, and then, look, he buys her back, verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels, and we have to assume he's buying her back from some sort of pimp here. That really is what's going on. He's buying her out of indentured servitude that she's gotten into through her own sex trade. Man, that's crazy, right? And that's supposed to be... Uh, you know, a picture of the Lord's voracious love for us. Listen, and here's where we're going in chapter four. Wow, he, in his mercy and justice and goodness, allows us to destroy our lives with sin, <laughs> right? And those are things we know we're going to have to get there in chapter four. And like, as soon as we get to chapter four, remember the prophets are a little bit bipolar. We're going to jump into a, another, a, another sin oracle where we're going to immediately see God bringing um, justice against the sinful nation and think, well, how can he pursue them with faithful love and also allow them to destroy their lives with sin? Well, that's who he is. He's, he's, he's never going to stop loving you. He's never going to stop pursuing you with, your love, with his love. But he's also not some you know, silly carnival ride where life is always constantly good. If you choose wickedness, you're going to reap it. And God's going to allow it to happen. But that doesn't change the way he feels about you, right? So, um, okay, thoughts or comments about chapter three? I think it's a beautiful chapter. So with five, verse five. I was here, hoping you'd ask. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. With, is that another restoration oracle? Yeah, or? so I, I see the whole chapter as one restoration oracle, okay. right? But the question we have to ask in verse five is when does that happen, right? And remember in our introduction to the prophets last week, I said one of the things about the prophets is when they start talking restoration, they get really spooky about it. And they will start talking about the life and ministry of Jesus. They'll start talking about the New Testament era. So when they're talking about the way God's going to restore the Israelites, they, they will start with the return from exile in 539 BC. And they'll fast forward all the way through to the life, death, and resurrection and second coming of Jesus. <laughs> so, um, yes. Is there any, uh, he bought her for 15 pieces of shekels of silver. Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. Yeah, I, I, that's that's a good question, Dad. I don't know. I don't have any it's thoughts. Twice as much. Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's good. I don't know. I don't. I. That's interesting. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. What was I saying? I'm sorry. That's all right. I was saying something about chapter verse five. Oh, the restoration. So we have to ask ourselves the question: When is this happening? Right. What do you think? What is verse five a description of? What, what event or events does that sound like it's describing? Is that what you're getting at, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? I think that's still the point. You know, I'm actually going to, for once, going to disagree with on this one and not make this about Jesus, which I normally do. Um, one, so here's, here's, a, here's a principle that we always do teach the students in Emmaus, that the, when you're looking at fulfillment of prophecy, you, look, you need to highly favor 
the fulfillment that is preferably near. So favor the preferably near fulfillment. In other words, when was the first time that something like this happened in the lifetime of this nation? Okay, and I think verse four sets it up. So verse four says the Israelites shall remain many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar. That to me sounds like the 70 years of exile in Babylon. That's many days. That's an entire lifetime without king or prince or sacrifice, right? And then God says in verse five, afterwards you're going to return to the land and seek the lord that sounds like anyone living through ezra and nehemiah when they're rebuilding the temple in 539 would say here we are right so i think the first time the nation of israel would say hey look god has actually restored us the way he said he was before this whole mess happened would be 536 bc when the israelites come back to the promised land but what's interesting is it goes beyond that and david will be their king right so we'll wait a second <laughs> You know, so now we're talking about a Davidic king. That's absolutely Jesus. Right. So I think what's interesting about this picture of restoration is it begins with the rebuilding of the temple in 536, but it continues through the lifetime of Jesus, the king in David's line, which is a really broad stroke of redemptive history for Israel. But that's the way the prophets talk. And there's a theological term for that. It's called proleptic prophecy, and, and it's, uh, it's hard. The way the prophets talk, uh, think about prophecy is they see mountaintop, 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 and the prophet's standing right here, and so they see this event, this event, this event, and they don't talk at all about the valleys of hundreds or even thousands of years in between them. They literally stack them on top of each other. The way if you were looking at a mountain range, you'd just see layer, 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 layer. You wouldn't see the towns and the valleys in between. Um, that's the way prophets talk. They love to do that. That's called proleptic prop. Uh, so I told you, I said proleptic. That's the wrong term. Sorry. Proleptic is something different. I'm rusty. This is called telescoping prophecy. This is called telescoping prophecy. Proleptic is when you mention it as though it's already happened, even though it's a future event. This is called telescoping prophecy. When you see a high, a high point, high point, high point, but you don't talk about the valleys in between. That's typical prophetic language, but boy, is it confusing, right? And again, uh, part of what I want to do with this class is just get you guys more comfortable with like, gosh, you know, how do we read the prophets? Um, yeah. Okay, thoughts, comments about chapter three, and then we'll move on to chapter four. There's a note in my Bible in reference to your definition about the, the price. Oh, okay. That, um, that, that, that actually 30 shekels of silver is the standard price for a slave, not 15 cloves and barley. And it may just be a reference to that either all slaves weren't bought to the same amount or that she had really just declined to that. So she wasn't worth that. She wasn't worth much. Yeah, wow. which kind of makes more sense theologically. Cool. That she was just not even worth the full price of the slave. Yeah. Yeah. Do y'all hear that online? No. That 15 shekels was only half the price of buying a slave back uh, at this time in Israel's history. So it might be a statement of this this lady was not even seen as um, valuable enough to be worth a whole uh, redemptive price. She's like, she's worthless in that sense. She's. <laughs> And I think that's, Kim was saying that's a pretty apt theological description of how Israel looks to God at this time, right? Yet he's still going to pursue her. <clears throat> All right, I hope you got your um, colored pencils out for your repeated word of whore. Remember, we like them. Uh, one of the things I want, to, want you to do is mark repeated words or repeated ideas we're going to see this repeated word of four over and over in chapter four and um we're going to flip now right back to sin and judgment so the restoration of the oracle is over and chapter four uh is going to be a big um lawsuit oracle actually and uh, i wanted to introduce you to a lawsuit oracle so i I'm, I'm, i want to um Recommend one other resource for you, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart. What this book does is it gives you a 
few chapters to read on every genre of scripture in the Bible. So there's different genres of scripture. You read the narratives different than the prophets. You read the prophets different than the Old Testament law. Okay, so this one on the prophets is really good, and it has a section on oracles, and I just want to read it to you um, just for a moment. We'll talk about what an oracle is. When one comes to the actual study and informed reading of the books of the prophets, the first thing one must learn to do is to think oracles. And they have it in all cap letters, like think oracles. Just like one must learn to think in paragraphs in the New Testament epistles. This is not an easy task, but know that it is difficult, but a necessary thing uh, in the beginning of your study. Most of the time, what the prophets said is presented in run-on fashion. Can anyone say amen to that, right? That is, the words they spoke at various times and places over the years of their ministry have been collected and written down without any divisions to indicate where one oracle ends and another begins. Moreover, even one, when one can assume by a major change of subject that a new oracle has probably begun, there is a lack of explanation with no editorial marks or transitional notes whatsoever, which still leave the reader asking, was this said the same day to the same audience? And is it the same message, right? And the answer is no, no, and no. Um, so we, what you have to do is learn to identify oracles and then think about them in units. Just as we've just put chapter three aside, now we're gonna pick up chapter four and it's gonna be something totally different, okay? And you just have to get comfortable with that with the prophets or else you're just going to constantly feel manic about reading. I'm like, well, wait, wait, wait. We were just talking about God's faithful love for Israel and now he's angry again, right? What's going on? All right. So um, what we have in chapter four is what, what most folks call a lawsuit oracle. And here's what I do. When I see oracles... Um, I mark them off to the side. If it's restoration, I mark it in blue. If it's sin, I mark it in red. If it's judgment, you know, I mark it in brown. In other words, I mark right down the side of my margin, an entire blue line for all of chapter three because it's a restoration oracle. But then in chapter four, we're going to get in a sin oracle. So I would take a, a red line and I go all the way down chapter four every time that we're talking about sin. And one of the times you're going to, one of the things you're going to see over and over in the prophets, when you get into a sin oracle, the oracle is usually going to start like this. Hear the word of the Lord, O Israel. Or hear, O Israel. And that's called a summons. And the language is the language of a judge. It's as if God were saying, you know when a judge walks in the courtroom, you know, somebody's like, all rise, right? That's the imagery. And oftentimes it's going to go like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord has an indictment against you. It's courtroom language, right? Like, God has a charge to bring against you. And then there's going to be a description of sin. So oftentimes what I do um, when, I, when I see that language that reminds me of a lawsuit oracle, I have a little symbol for that that I put in the margin. This is supposed to remind me of a megaphone, you know, like the cheerleaders have in college, right? And I just picture the, the oracle, da, 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 it's like a word, right? And I'll put an L in it to remind me this is a lawsuit oracle. Now that is like super nerdy. Uh, <laughs> you do not have to do that. But it's really helpful for me to, in chapter 4, verse 1, off to the side to see, okay, here's the beginning of a lawsuit oracle, and then the theme of red for sin follows it all the way to the end of the oracle. That helps me see the oracles. If you like doing that, I would do it for the restoration oracles too, okay? So when you see a restoration oracle, what I do is I put a little megaphone off to the side, and then I put a P in the middle or an R, either calling it a promise or a restoration oracle. Either one's fine. So if you're into restoration oracles. So chapter 3, verse 1, right next to it, I'd have a little megaphone with an R. And then all of chapter 3, I would have a blue line down the side of the margin. Okay, if you'll color your Bible like that, oh my goodness, things will get easier. Does that make sense? <clears throat> All right, so um, will somebody read, somebody online read chapter four, verses one through five. We're going to see the first part of this lawsuit oracle. We're going to see who it's about. We're going to talk about it. I will. Okay. All right. 
Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There's swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. For the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, and also the fish of the sea disappear. Yet let no one find fault and let none offer reproof. For your people are like those who contend with the priest. So you will stumble by day, and the prophet also will stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do you see chapter 4, verse 1? Hear the word of the Lord, O people Israel. And the Lord has an indictment, so he has a case against you. And then it's a big description of the sins of the people. You see that? So I would trace it in red all the way down the margin. Verse two, swearing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery, bloodshed follows bloodshed. You shall stumble by day, verse five. The prophet shall also stumble with you by night and I will destroy your mother. So here's this picture of, hey, God's, he sees what's going on. He's not gonna let this continue forever. And what you have to know, know though is remember, um, this is written to Israel during one of the wealthiest times in our whole history. None of this destruction has come upon them yet. And you got to ask yourself, were they paying attention? Did they think this was actually going to happen? No way. All right. So let's keep going. Chapter 4, um, verse 6. Will someone read verse 6 all the way through verse 10? And uh, if you're marking the theme of sin, it's just going to continue. The red is going to go all the way down into verse 10. Will someone read that 6 through 10? There you go. I'll read six through ten. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Birthday, Dan. Birthday, Dan. Thank you. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. They change, they charge, change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They're greedy for their iniquity. And, and it shall be like people, like priests, who will punish them for their ways. They repay and repay them for their deeds. They shall eat but not be satisfied. They shall play by winter, by whore, and not multiply. Because they have forsaken the Lord and, they, and devote themselves to whoredom. My awesome. wine, wine take away from understanding. Oh boy. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. So we're seeing a repeated who here. There's a who that's the focus of this oracle. And who is it? Who's in, who's in view here? And, but more specifically, which part of the people of Israel? It's repeated three times. Yeah, the priest. And I, I think the, the best we can sense here, the, the Hebrew, if you go read commentaries, there's a little debate about the phrasing of the Hebrew line, especially verse four. Let no one contend, let no one accuse. Um, I think the best translation is probably for with you, O priest, is my contention. Verse four, I think, is supposed to set this up. Not every translation reads that way. But I think the best translation in Hebrew is something like, I am contending against you, O priest. I think this is a lawsuit oracle, a sin oracle against the priestly portion of the nation of Israel. The very people who are supposed to be leading God into worship or leading Israel into worship, they're actually leading them into idolatry. And we see this over and over again. Um, verse 7, the more they increase, the more they sin. They change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. There's some element of leadership here, right? They're greedy for their own sin. It shall be like the people as it is with the priests. I will punish them for their ways, repay them for their deeds. Um, it seems to me like God is bringing a harsh condemnation against the religious leadership of Israel, who, if you remember Kings, is leading the nation of Israel into worship with golden calves. Dan and Bethel. 
Is it the actual priest, or is it is he calling to them the fact that he said, "I'll make you a nation of priests"? Yeah, I, I actually. I, there is some debate about this, but I actually think that we're talking about the false priests of the nation of the northern kingdom of Israel, who Jeroboam one set up not to lead priestly ministry in the temple in Jerusalem because that was in the southern kingdom, but to lead idolatrous worship in Dan and Bethel, these pagan centers of idolatry in the north. I think that's who he's talking to. Yeah. Let's keep going, read the end of the chapter. Um, you're going to see this theme of sin continue. Will somebody read in verse 12, read all the way through verse 19? And you're going to see this repeated word of whoredom and not mark it if you mark your repeated words. Anybody online want to read it, verse 12 through 19? I got you. Okay. My people consult a piece of wood and their divining rod gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have played the whore, forsaking their God. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and make offerings upon the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters play the whore and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with whores and sacrifice with temple prostitutes. Thus a people without understanding comes to ruin. Though you play the whore, O Israel, do not let Judah become guilty. Do not enter into Gilgal or go up to Beth-Avon and do not swear as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. When their drinking is ended, they indulge in sexual orgies. They love lewdness more than their glory. A wind has wrapped them in its wings and they shall be ashamed because of their altars. All righty, isn't that pleasant, Logan? <laughs> yeah, all right. So, okay, here's what's going on here. Um, and this is typical Old Testament Canaanite pagan idolatry. Dad, will you hold up one of those little bronze figurines you were showing? Okay, just grab it. doesn't matter which one. I just want people to see the size of it. So if you, if you go to Egypt today or any of the ancient Near East, you can find these little bronze figurines in gift shops. And th that, that is original to the Old Testament era from which we're discussing now. I don't know when exactly, but I guarantee you that thing is several thousand years old. There's another one, some kind of a cat god that looks pretty Egyptian to me. Um, the reason why I wanted Dad to show you these is because it sh shows you the size of these things. Um, yeah, there, there's a bull god. That's probably Hapis, one of the bull Egyptian gods. Let's see if you get the big one there. Get this, you get this one bigger? Yeah, that's fine. No, that's perfect, Dad. I just, I just wanted people to see the size. So the, the way idolatry worked. They originally were on these blocks. Yeah. Still on blocks. Yeah. Right. The holes are still in the blocks, but the blocks are too rotten to hold them. Right. So what would happen from the, from the time of the Canaanites right up to the first century? Um, the people that lived in this land would literally create little bronze gods that they would keep in their pockets. I mean, you, they're satchels. You talk about having God in your pocket, right? This little God who you pull out whenever you want to pray to him to grant your wishes. And then they would walk over to sacred sites all throughout Canaan, usually in a beautiful oak grove that's shady or up on a high hill. They would erect sacred trees. You see this sometimes like in Asheville, North Carolina, like there was a Wiccan tree behind our house in Asheville, North Carolina, and there were all these things hanging from the street, all these amulets, and, and the, the Wiccan, like witches and stuff, would come behind our house and would do like pagan rituals in our backyard. <laughs> this is actually happening over and over again. It's the strangest thing. Um, that's not too far off of what we're looking at here, and these gods that would be worshipped at these areas of pagan worship 
um, would actually be gods that when the people left that place, they would, they would have a little image of it and they would carry it around with them. And whenever they needed something from God, they would get it out and pray to it. It was always transactional and it was always based on the person's felt needs. So the major thing that the Israelites were praying to Baal for, which was the principal God they would do this with, was rain and harvest. And so what you have here in chapter four is a description of that thing. So when we see um, Hosea saying, hoard him, hoard him, hoard him, hoard him, um, he's, talk he's not talking about literal prostitution. He's talking about going to these places of pagan idolatry, pulling out these little idols and praying to them for physical blessing, okay? Towards the end of chapter four, we see this element of... Uh, sexuality that does enter into it verse 18 when the drinking is ended they indulge in sexual orgies what would often happen at these places of idol worship under these leafy trees up on these high hills is that people would get together they'd have a big party they'd get raging drunk and then they'd have a bunch of sex that's what would happen but they also had sex as part of their worship right so i mean not even like the orgy kind but just like these sacred prostitutes would just like be there and then they're like seeding for, because, for exactly so like for instance with Baal, one of the yeah. ways you would worship Baal is you'd have sex with the temple prostitute right. and that would, that would somehow appease Baal and cause rain to fall on the land that's what's going on in chapter four and um man god's not happy about it he's not at all so I would just encourage you to mark all of chapter four in sin. And it really is a gross, you know, that red line needs to go all the way through chapter four. Um, and unfortunately, it's going to go all the way through chapter five. But wait till you get to chapter six. It's really going to be wonderful. Um, <laughs> let's read. So let's read chapter five. What you're going to see in chapter five is sin all the way through verse five. And then it's going to shift to judgment. So will someone read chapter five, verses one through five? Uh, and then we'll do the next section. You want to be online? Yeah, somebody online would be good so everybody can hear. Chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. Anybody care to read it? No, I'll read again if it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, chapter 5. Okay. Hear this, give heed, O house of Israel. Listen, O house of the king, for the judgment applies to you, for you have been a and a net spread out on Tabor, and the revolters have gone to depravity, but I will chastise all of them. I know every Can't hear you. you have played the harlot. Really? Go ahead. Sorry, we lost it. Um, for now, can you go back that? to verse three. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Ephraim, and Israel is not. She's walking out. The harlot. Israel has defiled itself. Their deeds will not have to return to their God. All right. Lost your mom. That's all right. For the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they do not know their God. Verse 5, Israel's pride testifies against them. If Ephraim stumbles in his guilt, Judah also stumbles with him. Guys, why would pride come up in verse 5? Where's the pride come from? This is talking about Israel's idolatry. Why is, why is he mixing, why is Hosea mixing this idea of pride in there? Yeah, I think so. I think that's, there. there's this element. Nothing wrong. God surely doesn't have a problem with this. We must be awesome, right? Look at all, all the stuff. We, uh, verse six. So we're going to shift now from sin to judgment. Again, it's, it's rather stark, this transition. So this is where I pull out my color, my brown color. If you're tracing this, 
third theme of judgment, I would pull this out and I'd start marketing in verse six all the way down the margin of your page because we're going to get a big description of the Assyrians that are going to come real soon to take this nation out. Um, will somebody read verse six through 12? Well, six through 13, actually. We'll talk about it. Right. I got it. Yeah, go all the way to the end. Go six through the end of the chapter. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Uh-oh. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have borne illegitimate children. Now the new moon shall devour them along with their fields. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound the alarm at Beth Avon. Look behind you, Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of punishment. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who removed the landmark. On them, I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to go after vanity. Therefore, I am like maggots to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king, but he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I myself will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will beg my favor. So you see that shift from sin to judgment. We're talking about a prediction of judgment here. And it's a future event in Israel's lifetime. And we have to ask ourselves, when does this happen and when does it take place? And I'm going to tell you when, 722. Okay, so if you like writing in your Bibles, right from verse 6 all the way to verse 14, you need to say, Assyrian invasion of 722. It actually started in 732, but it hit Israel in 722. In 722, Tiglath Pileser III comes into the northern kingdom and completely destroys it. And this is a big description of that. In fact, verse 8, blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, sound the alarm in Beth Avon, which those are three towns along the major route that Tiglath Pileser came when he came to invade this nation. Those are three towns along the highway this king took. And in fact, Beth Avon means house of wickedness, right? That's so the, the imagery here is stark. Like you guys, God's taken out the house of, house of wickedness. He's going to bring it down and he's going to bring it down this way. Um, verse nine, Ephraim shall become a desolation. That's the nation of Israel. In the day of its punishment among the tribes of Israel, I will declare what is sure. Verse 11, Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to go after vanity. When was Israel crushed? And that's Ephraim. That's one of their surnames in the books of the prophets. They were crushed in 722 by the nation of Assyria. Verse 13 is an interesting description of how it happened. Ephraim, when he saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria. If you read the books of the kings, what you see is right before the Assyrians invaded Israel and Judah, both of these nations try and give a last-ditch alliance attempt with these kings. Say, oh, please don't take us out. We promise we'll serve you, right? Um, Hezekiah, for instance, when it happens to him. So Hezekiah gets wrapped up in this too, right? Verse 12, I'm like maggots to Ephraim, like rottenness to the house of Judah. Judah gets taken out. That's the southern kingdom. Ephraim's the northern kingdom. 